So over the last 45 days, I've talked to a lot of old clients. People have reached out to me on social media, tons of different elk hunters. And I always ask, how did the elk hunt go? If the hunt was unsuccessful, probably 95% of the hunters will say something like this. I had a great time. It was beautiful country. It was great habitat. We had a great camp set up. But then comes the excuses. There were so many other public hunters that just messed our whole hunt up. The season before we got there, an outfitter was in the area and he just shot everything. We knew exactly where the elk were and the day before the hunt, some idiots camped right where they bed. The elk were there, but they just stayed on private land the entire time. Turns out that there just aren't elk in that area. The list goes on and on, but there's a theme amongst all these excuses and that's that they all reflect that it wasn't your fault. I hate to say it, but this is wrong, folks. Almost all hunts give you a chance to be successful. Sure, there's volatility of how much of a chance, but over my years of being in the mountains, I exponentially grew as a guide and a hunter when I realized that failed hunts, unsuccessful hunts were almost always due to a single choice I made during that hunt or a set of choices I made during that hunt. I'm gonna go through the top real reasons why hunts are unsuccessful and all of these reasons are controllable and things we can work on as elk hunters. At the end of the video, I'm also gonna touch on something that we fret and have anxiety about and worry about, but it turns out it rarely matters at all, so stay tuned for that also. So first we need to cover why all of this matters. This really reflects a lot of what I talk about in the video on my channel that's why 5% of hunters kill 95% of all the elk. One of the things I harp on in that video is that you have to consciously reflect on your hunts. If you don't, you're missing a huge chance to learn and a huge chance to improve your success rate in the future. This particularly goes for the situation where you can hunt the same area, the same elk, you know, usually during the same time frame the next year. Always reflect on hunts, particularly in that situation, because you can use that information in the future. And that's what makes exceptional elk hunters. Contrary to what a lot of folks want to believe, there are elk hunters that have hunted for decades, but when you really look at their skill set and their knowledge base, they're still complete novices. A big part of that is they don't consciously reflect on their unsuccessful and successful hunts. That's also why you can see folks that are you know, into elk hunting three or four years and they are exceptional elk hunters. And that's because they consciously learn from their successful and unsuccessful hunts. It turns out that just time in the field or years as an elk hunter isn't that correlated to how great of an elk hunter you think you are or whatever. Okay, it really doesn't matter that much. What matters is that you're consciously trying to get better at it and build that knowledge base. Reflecting on hunts is a key component of that. Think about anything else that you've gotten good at in your life. It could be anything. Maybe you were a high school wrestler or a high school football player, whatever. Take one of those examples and think about how you got better. Probably the main way you got better was just iteration, right? Just practice, drilling certain aspects, and then practicing within a compressed time frame. And what that does when you practice something within a compressed time frame, it literally forces your brain to consciously reflect on your mistakes in the past. The reality for almost all modern day hunters is that we can't do that. We can't compress our hunting into a really short period of time. Yeah, in my videos, I do suggest that, but I understand that most folks can't do that for budgetary reasons, time reasons, family. There's a bunch of different reasons out there. The reality is you're kind of a weirdo if you can go hunt for 45 days straight a year. I understand that. So that iteration that we use in every other aspect, you know, in our history of getting good at a skill, we can't do that. So we have to do this post-mortem of hunts. It's even more important because we don't get that automatic reflection that we would through quick iteration of hunts. On your next hunts, as you drive out of the hunting area, if you're by yourself, you're gonna have to do it in your own brain. You can say it out loud, you know, however you wanna do it. If you've got hunting partners with you, it makes it even easier. But right then, when the hunt is fresh in your mind, reflect with yourself or your hunting partners. If the hunt was starting today, what would you do differently? 
If you go through that process as soon as possible, be after a hunt, that gives you a shortcut way to iterate on the, the hunt real quick and melt some of that knowledge into your brain and you're gonna keep that into the next year. Have those conversations. And that's what I'm gonna do with you guys at the end of this video. I'm gonna go through an unsuccessful Idaho elk hunt that I did in a new area with new elk and new terrain. I'm gonna go through that post-mortem with you guys. And a quick disclaimer, I know there's gonna be comments that are gonna come out and they're gonna say, oh, just because a hunt wasn't successful doesn't mean it's a failure. I get it, guys, and I totally agree. The experience matters a ton, but I also think that if you're going to be an elk hunter for the long term, why in the hell would you not try to become more successful? And I'm going to just use harvest rate as a proxy for success, okay? Yes, there's lots of other ways you can be successful or gain something from hunting, okay? I'm not denying that, but just for the ease of getting through this process and all of us getting better at it, that's the proxy I'm using. If you have no clue who I am, I don't blame you at all. My name's Cliff Gray. I guided and outfitted over the past decade in some of the most remote wilderness areas in North America. My insights and strategies in these videos is just based on that data set and experience. All I hope is that you get some value from that data set. If you do, please like this video and subscribe to the channel. All right, let's jump into why your hunt was a failure. I'm gonna go through the different categories here and this is going to account for 90 to 95 percent of hunts there's probably a good chance that your hunt falls into a couple of these different categories and if i missed one here that you think is very relevant please mention it in the comments every time i post a video i realize more and more that the folks that view these videos are a huge source of knowledge all right so i'm going to describe the category of failure i'm going to give you an example and then i'm going to give you some action and advice to improve it on your next time all right so the first reason that hunts fail i'm going to call this elk pinball so essentially what this is, is you were in an elky area, but you never consistently got into the elk. A good example of this is you hunt for five, six, seven days, you know, lots of sign that's two, three, four weeks old, you know, maybe a little fresh sign, just a, you know, a trickle of, you know, elk are still there, but you just don't seem to be quite in the right spot. The primary issue here is that you just don't have a depth of understanding of those local elk. You may know their plan A and B, but you don't know those elk plan C, D, E, and F. So this is a more difficult one on the action advice front because there's nothing really easy that you can do to improve this. The obvious one is that you need to hunt the area over and over. Yeah, no shit, Cliff. But you need to hunt it over and over because each year is going to give you a different set of variables, right? You know, different pressure on the public land, different pressure on the private land, you know, different level of snow, different temperatures, all those things play in. And after hunting an area over and over, you're going to know what the elk do under those different scenarios. And through that process, you're going to learn their hot spots. So that's the most difficult action advice I can give you. Just keep trying. A little trick to that that is don't give up on an area necessarily right if you bump around a lot particularly you know on heavily pressured elk yeah there's differences in the different areas but they're still heavily hunted elk and they're going to be elk that have this a b c d e f g h type of plan structure right like if it's they'll go to the next spot if it's bad they got hunting pressure there or whatever they're going to go to the next spot so you have to kind of focus on an area and start gaining that knowledge sooner rather than later quicker action advice here is to e-scout really thoroughly and try to gain some knowledge of the area here's what i would look for if I was looking at a new area and the only way I could look at it would be through scouting, right? Either on my computer, Google Earth, Onyx, or in the summer on foot. Look for the real hell holes that elk would potentially move into. And when I say hell holes, I don't mean X distance from a road, right? A lot of people equate, you know, a, an elk hell hole is as far away as possible from a road. That's not what I mean. I'm talking about stuff that is just hard to physically get into. It could be a mile from a road, could be a half mile from a road. Their access could be tricky. It could just have, you know, a bunch of rim rock around it. There's a lot of other things that make that access difficult. So I would be looking for those areas. In terms of the different spots that elk could move to, 
These are gonna be really good areas for bulls to go in post rut, just spots where they go hang out and they're not bothered after the rut. Even during archery season, during the rut, elk will go to if they're heavily pressured by hunting, right? They'll do the same thing in the rifle season too, where they just don't get the hunting pressure. This is very important in areas like Colorado where the hunting pressure can be intense in these wilderness over-the-counter units. A couple tricks to finding them is to look at a map you're gonna see you know, tight topography around these spots. You're gonna see that it's you know, difficult to get in there. It could, it could be you know, artificial type of things that make it difficult too. It could be that there's no hunting pressure in there because somebody doesn't wanna walk up a fence line along a super steep hill because that's the only public access in there, those sort of things, right? So look for those things, right? Just physical and artificial you know, property boundary type of things that make it difficult. That's the first thing that I would really focus on. The other thing is, is these hell holes still have to have what elk need to survive. They need to have some water and they need to have some feed. So those need to be in those areas. If you just find some like craggy mess somewhere, you know, that looks exactly like this, really hard to get into, but there's no water in there anywhere for a couple miles or something, it's probably not worth your time. The other tip I'll give you, a lot of folks will focus on this kind of limited access country but what they don't realize is that if they just go across the road or you know they climb up this other hillside, it's very easy to glass in there. Or it could be this, you drive up a switchback on the other side of the drainage, you can glass right into what you are thinking is an elk kind of, you know, good little secret spot, you know, lay down spot for some elk, that sort of thing, right? Well, if hunters can glass in there, and if there's a good glassing spot to glass into those spots, if they're easy spots to glass like that, they are not the spots I'm talking about. Yes, there will be times that you'll catch elk in there, but that's not what we're talking about here. Elk generally will not go in those areas and hole up for long periods of time because some hunter, you know, some local or somebody that knows the area, he knows that glassing spot and he's gonna find them and then he's gonna go in there and kill them. There's something I noticed that's very interesting with hunters. If they glass up elk, they're, if they physically see elk through their glass, they're willing to go through a whole hell of a lot to get those elk killed. Now, if they can't glass up those elk, right, from an easy location, they just can't see them, most hunters are very unwilling to go in there blindly. And there's good reason for that. It eats up your logistics, it eats up your time. But the other thing they're typically unwilling to do is you could have a little hole here that looks high potential, you can't glass it from anywhere else, and it's a booger to get in there and actually hunt it where you can you know, actually kill an animal in there. But if you look, there's another strategic spot, right? Maybe it's just a little half mile trail up. You know, it just takes a little work and you can get up to another glassing spot and glass back in there. Not an easy glassing spot, something that takes a little bit of work. Those are the sweet spot a lot of the time, right? The guys that can just quickly get to the glassing spots aren't finding them, but they're spots where you can save a little bit on logistics by doing a shorter hike, get to a good glassing corner, glass back in that hole, check it out. A lot of times, those are worth your time, and when you're in this scenario where you're in an elky spot but you can't find the elk, those are the spots where elk are a lot of the time. The other tip I'll throw out here is go scout in the spring melt off, right? When the grass is getting green. This is particularly the case for mountain units, for units with a ton of elevation grade, for units where elk are coming out of a, you know, maybe a different unit, another part of the state, and they're coming up into the mountains. Catch them when they're coming up in the spring and scout them during that period of time and watch them. A lot of the areas that they just historically move through, these spots where they hole up are going to be close to those routes, right? So if you're watching hillsides, you know, you're watching a ridge, and just day over day as that grass greens up, just elk are bailing over it right there, somewhere along that path, you know, it might be a quarter mile off, it might be, you know, somewhere above it, that sort of thing. Those spots, you know, these spots that pressured elk move off into or elk that just want to hole up move off into, they're going to be near those kind of corridors. So that can be time well spent. The last thing I'll leave you with on this category is that you have to understand elk a little bit, right? You have to understand where they're at certain times of year, what their general behavior is. For our rifle hunts in Colorado, the main one is that these bulls are typically post-rut, 
They're in bachelor groups, could be five bulls, 10 bulls, 20 bulls, could be one bull, could be two bulls. But they're finding these locations that have what they need and they're not messed with, right? So you have to know that sort of information so you focus in on the right type of spots. And you'll learn that over time. If you got a cow tag, you might, you might mix it up and look for more like cow areas where they go that time of year, right? And that, te that tends to be more mellow country. If there's an alfalfa field somewhere, you know, in the middle of November off on private, but you can catch elk moving in there, you know, out of cedars or something like that that's on public, that's where you're going to easily catch cow calf groups, right? But that's different than bull groups. So you'll learn that over time and I'll, and I'll try to do some videos on that in the future too. There's little things you pick up about what the elk are doing in your area during certain periods, periods of time. And that, you know, general biology type of information, that'll help you if your hunt fell into this category also. Next category, I'm just gonna call it a logistical failure. So what this is, is you found elk, you found smoking sign, but you just ran out of time. For the example on this one, I'm gonna wait till the end because this is the primary category that my Idaho elk hunt fell into. So we'll go deeper into this example at the end of the video. Almost always the primary issue here is logistical knowledge of the area. This is really simple stuff, but sometimes it takes a hunt to figure out. The right trails to get into specific drainages, how you can drop through drainages, how you can get in the bottom of drainages. And the key one is, where is the best glassing, right? You can e-scout those spots, but a lot of times you gotta be there to actually see the best glassing spots. All of that falls into this category. And a lot of times you feel good about these hunts because if you reflect on the hunt, you know, particularly like I said, like as you leave the hunt, you'll be thinking, man, if we were starting today, we would be killing some elk during this hunt. So action advice on this category is also gonna go with that Idaho example I give at the end of the video. So the third reason why your hunt was a failure. I'm gonna call this conventional wisdom and institutional inbreeding. I stole that phrase from Pat Mack. You can check out his YouTube. It's a phrase that makes sense. There's all this conventional wisdom out there, right? When it comes to the elk hunting, things like get as far away from the road as possible. Over the counter elk are always at timberline or above during archery season. If there's a bunch of trucks at the parking lot, don't even bother. The elk are going to be blown out of there. The elk in that area never come off private land. This is all conventional wisdom that you will hear and it's good advice if it's generalized. You have to view it as generalizations. And a lot of times where we're talking about hunting situations where the overall success rate's fairly low, taking advantage of those exceptions is what's gonna get you success. So really ingraining yourself and being inflexible when it comes to this conventional wisdom, it actually hurts the chances of success for a lot of elk hunters. And the reason for that is a lot of this conventional wisdom is really from observations of pressured elk. That's what they do when they're pressured, right? They go to private land, they go deep into the wilderness, they get above timberline, they get high elevation. They do do these things in general, and that's obvious, but the reason they do those things is so you can't kill them, right? So you have to find the exceptions to that common knowledge about elk, right? You have to find when those elk come off the private. What type of variables might change in the next few days? You know, hunting pressure, or somebody's gonna hunt that private land, weather's gonna change, they might come off of that land. In other situations where, yeah, the elk might generally be up high elevation out of the bugs where there's a bunch of water to rut, but now there's 50 archery elk hunters up there and they've been working them for four or five days, there's a chance they're gonna show up down in the Ponderosa, down in the Pinion Juniper. Yeah, they're rutting, but they still might show up down there. So you have to learn those little exceptions and you're gonna start killing more elk. The other issue here is that Getting ingrained in this conventional wisdom results in you wasting a bunch of time on your elk hunt. I touch on this topic in my video that's on when you should change elk hunting spots. And what people do here is they go really deep into the wilderness before they know the area and they get way deep but in an area that doesn't have a lot of options, right? They get stuck way back in the, you know, the, the head of a drainage that's way back in there and they can't, they can't 
jump drainage without just a logistical nightmare. This is a perfect example of conventional wisdom causing people problems. What they've done is they've looked at a map, figured out you know how you know how could I get the furthest way from the road, and they end up in these really limiting situations where the logistics are a nightmare. So you kind of get the logistics category clashing with this category. The other obvious one I mentioned it as an example is that people observe hunting pressure in the area they plan on hunting and this could just be you know at a trailhead they see more trucks than they expected or you know once they hike in they see a little more pressure than they expected and then they just bail on the trip or immediately they have such a negative outlook on things that they're gonna bail within the first like 12 24 hours those are situations where that conventional wisdom is a real problem right hunting pressure ruins everything well this isn't gonna be new to you guys but these easy to draw tags, there's gonna be a pile of hunting pressure. And the reality is there's a ton of information out there where there's more elk, at least for short periods of time during certain parts of a season. The spots that have more pressure, it's for a reason. And that's that just historically those areas have held more elk, right? So you have to manage that and realize that, you know, yeah, there's some pressure around could be a bad indicator, could be good, you know, could be even a good indicator, who knows, could work to your advantage. Don't let that conventional wisdom that there's orange hats everywhere, that ruins your hunt. Don't let that ruin your hunt. So my action plan here for you is when you're having a tough hunt and you're really thinking about that conventional knowledge when it comes to elk, this comes into play with elk a lot because they're always screwing with conventional wisdom also, right? Yes, there's certain things they like, but they're a super adaptable species. You're not gonna see a mountain goat walking across a 100 acre meadow or something, right? But an elk, one day could be in the alpine, the next day he could be damn near feeding in the desert if he feels like that's what he needs to do. They're highly adaptable, right? So keep that in mind, particularly with elk, that yeah, you're not finding them where you thought you were gonna find them maybe, but don't write off 80% of the country or 80% of the situations because elk just don't do that, right? That's my main action advice on this category. So the fourth reason that your hunt was a failure is because of your ego and expectations. Western hunting and hunting up in the mountains is a steep learning curve endeavor. It just is. I've done a lot of challenging things in my life in the outdoors, but this type of hunting is one of the hardest. Right when you think you have elk hunting figured out, you'll realize you have so much more to learn. That's how I feel right now. There's so much depth to this type of hunting. It's a combination of mountain logistics, animal behavior, physical preparedness, planning and management of the hunt. All of that wrapped into one thing. That's what elk hunting is. You know, everything on Instagram, YouTube, all the products that are flowing into the business. And I've got a video that touches on this, guys. It's called The Truth About the Hunting Industry. Go check it out. But all of that stuff that is a part of hunting now, it makes us think that we can buy ourselves in to becoming a proficient elk hunter. But the reality is, the mountain and the elk that live in those mountains care less about the thousands of dollars you've spent on gear. And I alluded to this in the beginning. This is something we all worry about, right? We all worry about gear for months and months and months. The percentage of failed hunts that are due to just, you know, incrementally worse gear, it's like negligible, right? But the incremental difference on these other topics I'm talking about is huge. It's probably a hundred fold, you know, this gear topic. And it messes with our ego and expectation going into these hunts. I've always framed it this way to my clients and friends that want to get into elk hunting because it works for me too. If you think you're going to rush out and dominate the mountains and the elk that are in it on your first trip, your second trip, or your 50th trip, you're in for a rude awakening. Unless you just get dealt a bunch of luck, and that happens to people, and it's almost a curse. You know, they go out on their first elk hunt, they call a bull in the first day, you know, they shoot it or they get a shot at it, and then for the next 15 years, they're, they're clinging to try to recreate that, right? But that's another topic. What I'm talking about here is have the right expectations. You're starting something that has a steep learning curve, don't think you're gonna kill it the first time. And the reason this is relevant and the reason that it causes failure on hunts is that a lot of times guys quit during hunts because of this, right? The first two or three days were not what they were imagining, so now they're ready to just throw in the towel. That happens a lot and it's really unfortunate. Okay, so my action advice here, 
First, do not get into gear masturbation for months and months on end. Great gear is just great. It's not gonna compensate for learned knowledge. The second action advice is have a beginner's mind. This is a Zen Buddhism concept, this beginner's mind. Go into every hunt and as you progress as a hunter, go into it as if you were a beginner and you're there to learn. There's two reasons this helps out a lot. The big one, and kind of the topic of this video, is it lets you learn while you're out there. That's obvious, right? If you close yourself off and think you know everything, you can't let stimuli from the hunt and things that happen during the hunt come into your brain as new information where you can use that on future hunts. You have to have a beginner's mind to be able to do that. The second thing is, is a beginner's mind reduces stress a ton. And I talk about stress a lot in the video that's why elk hunters quit. Go check that out because that, that's really the extension of this conversation, right? Why do elk hunters quit? And that's, they just, they just don't go through the whole period of the hunt. That's, a, that's really in this category, right? It's obvious to me, so I don't have it as a separate category for failure, but you know, the wrong expectations and your ego, and then you combine that with stress, you quit early. It's just simple math. That's why you weren't successful. You didn't give the hunt a chance because you quit early. So go check that video out for more action advice on this topic. That beginner's mind reduces stress a lot and it'll help you get through hunts. So an example of how I reflect on my hunts, and like I said, I try to do this as soon as possible, but it's only been a couple months from your guys' fall elk hunt, so you can surely do it right now. But the best time to do this is in the truck as you leave a hunting area, you know, on the horses and mules as you pack out of the wilderness. But you're my hunting partner as we leave this hunting area, okay? And this was a real hunt in Idaho. Let's do it. For reference, we went into a new area. Neither you or I knew the area really well. We had some general understanding of the topography. We had some local knowledge from, from locals that we knew. We knew there was an outfitter in the, in the area. We knew the logistics were fairly difficult. It was an easy tag to get for a resident and a non-resident. So we knew the elk were also heavily pressured, all right? From a hunting pressure standpoint, this hunt was very similar to all the elk hunting I've done in wilderness areas in Colorado. Tag availability equals pressure. We hunted for six days. We did a bunch of long day hikes. We crossed rivers via pack raft to get into certain drainages. And we traveled a lot by truck and side by side to glassing areas. We actually glassed from areas that were quite a bit away from where we were elk hunting. We were dealing with big rivers in, in this unit. We hunted for six days and we didn't see any elk until the third day. Once we were able to locate those elk, we ate up a lot of time with the logistics, including pack raft. We were new to that, so getting those logistics figured out how to do it safely, you know, do it in the, doing it in the dark so we were hunting during prime hours, all of those things took us some time to figure out. We had two days of what I would call successful elk location and putting stocks on elk. On both those days, we were a little short on luck. We ended up, you know, instead of being sub 400 yards from elk where we saw them in the morning, we would end up 900 yards from elk or 1200 yards from elk. So it was that kind of setup. So we went home empty handed. So let's cover the positive aspects of this hunt right off the bat. My hunting partner, Zach and I, we stayed positive the whole time and we had a blast. We knew we were learning new elk and we were learning a new area. I feel like we both very much kept the beginner's mind about the whole situation. And a lot of that beginner's mind concept here actually applied to some of the difficult logistics. I've done a ton of backpack hunting in my life and I've done a ton of elk hunting via horse and mule, all right? But I haven't done very much hunting that involves crossing big bodies of water and using rafts. So there in particular, it mattered to have that beginner's mind and really learn how to do it so that knowledge could be used in future hunts. The other massive positive that Zach and I left this hunt with was a ton of specific knowledge in that area. And it's an area that we could potentially hunt every year given the tag availability. Now the quote negative or the choices that made this a unsuccessful hunt, a failed hunt, right? Cause that's what it was. We were not successful in our goal to harvest elk. What was the big factor there? Primarily logistics. Like I told you, it took us three days to find the better glassing spots where we could find elk. In this particular situation, the rivers threw me off. I'm not used to rivers in the sense that they're rivers that are hard to cross. You can't just, you know, 
You can't wade across them. That, that would be a good way to die, right? We're talking that type of river. So that threw me off and it messed up my logistical planning, right? I wasn't looking at glassing spots. They were on the other side of the river, you know, or up high. The other thing, because it's kind of these big river, you know, these big river drainages, it was all up out of there. I'm not used to that. For the last decade of guiding and outfitting, I was a hunt, I was hunting a lot of country that was either big, open, baldy, alpine stuff, like the collegians in Colorado, or it was like the flat tops, you know, good horse country, but where you got elevation, it was rolling country. You could get on rims and glass across there and see a lot, look across the plateau, that sort of thing. This kind of country was, it wasn't, it wasn't any more rugged than what I was used to hunting, but it was very dependent on those river systems. And if you weren't in specific spots, you were not gonna be able to glass into the grain of those drainages and see. And I didn't realize that. So the biggest failure in choice was not knowing the exact spots we were gonna glass from to locate elk off the bat. It took us three days of our six day hunt to do that. And that ate up our logistics, right? This is a really common point of failure on elk hunts. And I can fully say that that was the primary issue here. So right now I'm imagining that you are Zach, my hunting partner, and we actually did this, but we're leaving the area. We've got a three or four hour drive, you know, back, back to town from this remote area. So what would we do if we were starting the hunt tomorrow? First, we would have all of our logistics down, right? We would already know how to use those pack rafts and know how to safely do it in the dark. Two, we'll know how to drop down these big drainages and get out the bottom of them. That was another logistical thing we ran into. And three, and these are in no particular order because this is probably the number one thing. Three, we're gonna go to the glassing spots that we know now. They're fairly difficult to get to and they eat up like half a day, but the value we get from going to those specific glassing points and seeing in to a lot of that unit is huge and we're gonna go there right off the bat. If we had another six day hunt, I can almost guarantee it would go like this. Day one, glass, 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 almost all day probably, all through the morning, prime time hours, Try to glass during the day. In this particular area, you could see into the country pretty well if you got into the right spots. You could probably even glass for bedded elk during the day or elk going to the water or going to water. So the whole first day we would figure that out. Given that once we were at those glassing spots during this hunt, we started to pick up elk during every glassing session. I'm pretty confident from those spots over the first day or day and a half, we were gonna locate elk. And then it would just be logistical play after the logistical play after the logistical play until we hit it right. So we would cross this river with pack rafts in the dark, hunt that. We'd end up in the elk or we wouldn't. We'd go up a drainage and we'd drop down the drainage, maybe do an overnight and come out the bottom. We would do several of those type of drops, right? We would have all those logistics figured out. But the key is we'd get to those glassing spots, glass, 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 find our elk, and then boom, 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 boom. If we lost the elk, we would go back to the glassing spots, find them, and go in and make plays on those elk. I truly think that if we had six more days, that's what would work. And going through that kind of hunt post-mortem process and grains in our brains for the next time we hunt that area, we're gonna know the exact action steps to do before the hunt and when the hunt starts. It's worked so well for me. I think if you consciously reflect on hunts and focus on improving, you're gonna see massive gains in your future success rate on these hunts. Here in the next few months, I'm gonna put out some elk hunting planning episodes, so that should help folks also. If you wanna dive deeper into some of the topics that I covered in this video, check out my video right here, why 5% of hunters kill 95% of the elk. I dive into a lot of these topics. If you got value from this, please hit that like button, subscribe to the channel. It helps me out a ton, folks. Thanks.